Well, first off, uh, my name is Youngmoo Kim. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering, and I'll be your professor, your, well, your lead instructor for EC101. EC101 is a little different from other courses, and it's also different from past, uh, past years and past terms. I mean, not just because we're all online, but because uh, we're doing some restructuring. So thanks everyone for, for popping in the messages. Um, you are all muted because this is a webinar. The, the class is so big that it really doesn't make sense to have everybody in Zoom boxes because I wouldn't be able to distinguish anything. Um, so, but we're gonna experiment. We're gonna try to do some different things. So um, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, the Death Star. We, we built that over Christmas a couple of years ago, my son and I. So, um, okay. Let me, let me go through some logistics, all right? And then I'm gonna try to find other ways that we can still interact despite of uh, what's going on uh, with this Zoom webinar. So first off, um, this is the chat. I'm gonna be posting a few things in there. You can also ask questions in the Q&A, right? In the Q&A section. So uh, I'll leave some time for that. Uh, if you have questions throughout, I'll, I'll try to keep checking it. I'm trying to do multiple windows here. Uh, and I'll just have you know, the reason I started late is because I just came from another event that was a disaster. It was a one hour panel where I spent 45 minutes of it trying to connect. <laughs> so, you know, I am on the lookout for, for tech glitches right now. Zoom has been pretty rock solid. They were trying to use something weird. So hopefully uh, I've already paid my technical debt for today. So um, let's see, all right, I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, that's not what I want to do. I'm going to share this screen and we're going to do that. All right. So I hope you are seeing my slides now. Um, of course, that gets rid of my messages window. Okay, Q&A. Uh, the weekly survey, yes, will be released after lecture. I'll have more info on that shortly. Um, where does my messages window go? Ah, there it is. Okay. Cool. All right. First thing is that, uh, okay. Sorry, let me, I'm just getting all my notes reorganized. All right. Here is a link for you all to start playing around with a little bit. This is our class. I mean, it's a shared Google Sheet. It's a class roster. And if you can just go in there, you should have access. Find your name. And you can just start typing stuff in, right? Like your nickname, maybe your hometown, your favorite music. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to share. You don't have to share anything if you don't want. But I would like you to write, you know, what excites you most about electrical and computer engineering. Because that really is um, part of this course. Um, for those of you who are raising hands, I can't see that right now. So if you can ask your question in the Q&A. Um, I'll be able to see it there. Okay. Um, all right. So you're hopefully you're seeing my screen. This is actually the original title for this class, right? Um, you all decided to be electrical and computer engineering majors, at least I think most of you. Uh, and I, you know, I, I hope you, that was a good decision on your part. Um, but I, I'm sure you had good reasons for that because uh, the, um, you know, what we're, I, I think electrical and computer engineering is the best field in the world. Of course, I would say that. I'm a professor. But I think that the possibilities within electrical and computer engineering are amazing and limitless. So let's see. We have a question. How big is the class? There are 125 students so far. So, uh, and there may be more who registered just today. So, okay. So the way this class works is that we only meet once a week for 50 minutes. And it's a different speaker and a different topic every week. They are, of course, all related to electrical and computer engineering. But really, the emphasis is how is electrical and computer engineering impacting the real world? What is it good for? What is it doing? Right. Um, so your jobs are to attend the class and watch. You know, be be present at the webinar. Uh, we're not. I mean, we're recording these for later, but you can't watch the recordings. You have to uh, attend in person and then um, submit a short in-class survey. Today, we will have that survey. It's an in-practice survey, or sorry, we'll do a practice survey today. It's uh, the intention is that you start filling it out towards the end of class. It becomes available at 2.45 
p.m. and it's due at 3 p.m. Right. <clears throat> so you have 15 minutes. It is super short. It's super short. Let's see. Too much traffic. Uh, oh, because on the on the Google Sheet, yeah, yeah. If there's if there's like 50 people all trying to type in at once, it's gonna it's gonna give you some issues. So just keep refreshing it uh, as people kind of go in and out. Um, you'll be able to get into that Google Sheet. Okay, so you have one assignment per week. Well, really, I mean, be at the class and then do this very short survey, which should take you like just a minute or two, right? <clears throat> uh, and so the grading for the course is entirely attendance and survey based, right? Uh, if you make it to all classes, all 10 weeks and submit all surveys, that shouldn't be that hard, you will get an A+. Plus. But because life happens and because sometimes uh, un unexpected things may get in the way, you can still miss one class or one and one survey and uh, get an A, you miss two, you get a B, so on and so forth, right? This is the entire grading system for the class, right? There, there, um, the, uh, what was I gonna say? There will be, um, there will be some extra credit opportunities and I'll have one even today where you can sort of uh, bank uh, an extra class or two, right? If you know you need to miss something in the future, right? Or even make up for one. But we'll have like two or three of those opportunities throughout the term. But again, the easiest way to get an A plus in this class, just show up, fill out the short survey, you're done, right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, if you are, if you just registered for the class yesterday, yes, you would not be in the spreadsheet because I downloaded it yesterday. Um, that's okay. Uh, if you want to add yourself, go ahead. If you can get into it. I know people are having trouble accessing the spreadsheet right now. Google Sheets was designed for a lot of people. It was apparently not designed for 125. So we're pushing the boundaries of technology. Here. Okay. So uh, for right now, everyone still can hear me and see the, see the screen and all that. We're good there. Okay, cool. Let's get into real stuff. This is today's topic. This is my topic. This is my lecture. Uh, and of course, I've been at Drexel since 2005. I direct a laboratory called the Music and Entertainment Technology Lab. Uh, I'm going to guess some of you have been to concerts, you know, obviously pre pandemic, you know, when you could actually go to concerts. Uh, and you may have noticed there's a lot of technology on stage. All right. So anytime you go to like a big pop concert or even other kinds of concerts that you would, you know, there's, they're so technologically driven now, whether it's screens, whether it's projections, whether it's lights that track performers, whether it's all sorts of crazy effects, there are drones, all sorts of fun stuff like that, right? Um, hey, what happened to the last question? Oh, somebody edited it. The, the question is, what excites you most about ECE, about electrical and computer engineering? Let me type that back. <clears throat> right. Or you can also interpret it, why did you decide to be an ECE major? Right. Uh, it's not just concerts. If you've been to Broadway shows and plays, right? I mean, this is a scene from the Harry Potter play, which is amazing if you haven't seen it. Uh, but they bring that world of, you know, visual effects from Harry Potter movies onto a real stage. I mean, there are wand duels, there are people flying, there's all sorts of amazing stuff, right? That is, again, dependent on a great deal of technology. Uh, if you've ever seen Cirque du Soleil or any of this, well, this, this show in particular, this is Ka, which is based in Las Vegas. Um, <clears throat> it is, uh, this entire stage is a giant robot. It's a, it's a massive platform that can spin and rotate in every direction. Uh, the Cirque du Soleil, so they're all acrobats. So this, the stage will actually become vertical and they have to hold on to things to stay on the stage. Uh, and then they'll actually do things like drop down. And fortunately there's a net beneath them, but, uh, but it's all electromechanically controlled, right? Amazing amount of coordination technology that has to go into that, right? So, and of course, if you've you know, been to any theme parks recently, right? Theme parks are really pushing the boundaries of how we use electrical and computer engineering uh, to immerse yourself in a different world Right here, you can be in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon down at uh, Disney's Galaxy's Edge, uh, but so many other different uh, different uh, kinds of uh, rides and different kinds of experiences. So um, a lot of this has really changed just over the past 10 or 20 years due to advances in technology. Uh, now, I've shown you examples that are absolutely cutting edge, 
but I want to tell you the story a little bit of how these ele core electrical and computer engineering technologies have transformed the world, uh, the worlds of music and entertainment. Right. So I, uh, I, I'm a professor. I also direct this thing called the Excite Center. Um, if you're just a first year student, uh, just joining us at Drexel uh, for the first time this, this term, well, first of all, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you as a dragon and we wish you uh, lots of wonderful things over the next four or five years. Uh, and we're very, very sorry that we have to start this way. Normally this class is in a big lecture hall. I have a giant screen. I get to show you stuff, you know, more in person, but you know, this is what we're stuck with. <clears throat> So um, the Excite Center is uh, it's a space on campus. It's about 12,000 square feet. Uh, and it's a, it's a research center devoted to this topic, expressive and creative interaction technologies, right? This merger of not just engineering, but design of art, of creativity, of entrepreneurship, uh, and of course, education. Um, you can learn more about the Excite Center at that website, drexel.edu slash excite. You can see some of the things we're working on. Follow us on Twitter at Excite Center, at Excite Center, uh, or follow me on Twitter, and you can hear all about the other things that uh, the things that are happening at the Excite Center and my other projects. Uh, it's just my first name at Young Moo. Um, so if you're on Twitter, and I'm sure a few of you are, uh, you know, I always like to get the follower count up. So um, I'm not going to guarantee any extra credit for that, but if you if you follow me, I'll you know uh, I'll make it worth your while. This is what the inside of the Excite Center looks like. It's on 34th and Market Street. Uh, this was for a hackathon we did a couple of years ago, a uh, music hackathon, music technology hackathon. Um, and Excite is all about bringing together people from different fields to solve problems and to do cool things. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I'm just answering a question. <clears throat> Within the center is my lab, my research lab, which we call the Music and Entertainment Technology Lab. Um, and again, uh, almost all of my students are electrical and computer engineering students, both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so I started this lab uh, when I first came to Drexel in 2005. And I'm going to show you some examples of our work. Uh, I'm going to play some videos for you, of uh, projects that we've done. And what I will do is, in case the Zoom feed isn't working so great, I will also post links to those videos uh, in the chat here, All right? So um, this is an older one. We did this about eight years ago, but I still think it holds up. Top he come grooving up slowly. He got juju eyeball. He won holly roller. He got hair down to his knees. Got to be a joker. He just do what he please. <laughs> He got toe jam football, he got monkey finger, he shoot coca cola, he say, I know you, you know me, one thing I can tell you is you got to be free, come together, right now, now. over me. So the story this way, you can see from the credits here, right? We had about 15 students working on this project, uh, most of them from electrical and computer engineering, uh, but doing all aspects of this, right? We got we had this amazing project to bring six of these uh, adult-sized humanoid robots uh, that are manufactured and designed in Korea to bring them to Drexel, um, and then we were going to share them with other universities, right? Because um, we've done a lot of work with humanoid robotics. Now, 
humanoid robots are, are not easy to work with. <laughs> uh, we didn't know how to program that at the beginning. We were just learning. So we said, How's, what's the best way we can learn about this? Well, you know, let's put them together and try to do a music video, right? We had no idea how to program the robots, had no idea what kind of music we were gonna do. We, um, uh, you know, you can't go to Guitar Center and buy instruments for robots. They don't have that section yet. So uh, we decided, well, we have to build our own. What can the robot do? The robot can kind of move its arms up and down. We can figure out how to do that. So maybe we can have it hit things. Okay, we can have it hit drums. Cool, okay, we can have it hit drums. And then maybe, hey, 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 have you seen Blue Man Group? Blue Man Group, you know, the, the show where they, they, they hit things and they're like tubes and they can make sound. Yeah, yeah, and we're engineers. We can figure out, you know, how to make those tubes the right length to make the right pitch. And then, okay, okay, so we have four robots that we're gonna use. One's gonna play drums. We have three robots to play these tube things. Okay, they each have two arms, so that's six notes. Well, what if we, what if the rope arms can move sort of side to side? And so each arm can hit two notes. All right, now we have 12 notes. What songs can you play with 12 notes? There are not that many. So um, we decided uh, after a lot of thinking about this, we did a photo shoot with the Drexel PR office after we got the robots. They wanted to shoot a scene um, that mimicked the Beatles' Abbey Road, uh, the, the album cover for Abbey Road, which was uh, you know in one of the pop-ups back there. And so we actually took the robots out to 36th, 36th and Bering Street, so right on our campus, uh, you know, blocked off the roads, set up the robots to look like they're crossing the road. Uh, we even got clothes. They don't make clothes for robots. We had to go, you know, get custom-fitted clothes to make the robots look like they're wearing the clothes of the Beatles. It was crazy. But after that, we said, well, maybe we should do a Beatles song. Right? And well, what's well, on Abbey Road? And we just started, and it all just started naturally, you know, pardon the pun, but it came together uh, very quickly to say, look, that's a perfect song. And it really showcased what we could do. Now that whole process for making this music video uh, took three weeks, three weeks from when we said, okay, we're gonna make this music video to, you know, actually uh, sharing it. And again, there were a lot of sleepless nights. It was crazy. Uh, we built those instruments the, we called them hubophones, those tube instruments. We built those from scratch. We programmed the robots. We did all the video and audio recording and mixing and production. And we put that out there in three, three weeks, right? Uh, who came up with the lyrics is uh, the Beatles did, uh, John Lennon. John Lennon wrote the song. So um, they don't make any sense and they still don't make any sense. But uh, you know, you can interpret them as you will, okay? So um, just I use this as an example of how you can problem solve or how, how doing something creative can help you problem solve very quickly. When you have a goal, not just to, hey, I need to get this thing to work, but you know, hey, I need to get this thing to you know, make a sound or to do a thing or to, to, to do something for a video. It can be not just really focusing, it can be really motivating as well. So I love doing these kinds of creative projects um, that whether it's gonna be a video or a website or whatever, that really gives a, a creative highlight to the technology that we're, create, that we're using. There's a very piece, different piece of technology. Uh, some of you probably play the piano out there. If you wanna put that in the Google sheet, you can say, uh, you know, hey, if you wanna play the piano. Um, we have a very special piano at the Excite Center that we built. It's called the Magnetic Resonator Piano. Uh, what is the piano? Where on top of each key, well, on top of each string, actually, there's an electromagnet, right? An electromagnet is just an electronically controlled magnet. And, but by varying that magnetic field very precisely, we can bring those strings to vibration and we can create all sorts of sounds that aren't possible on a normal piano. So I'll play some of that for you. By the way, the person playing this is Mark Carey. Mark is an amazing jazz pianist. He's a Grammy-nominated artist. Um, 
one of my favorite things about this video is that this was filmed about 10, 15 minutes right after Mark first sat down at this piano. So it's not like he'd been practicing for hours or days. It's all there at his fingertips that the, um, you can sort of see in this shot, we have a controller board that's actually sensing the movement of the keys and that's controlling the magnets. Uh, and you can see from some of the other shots here, right, that's what the magnets look like sitting on top of the piano. So we are bringing the world of electronic synthesis to an actual physical instrument, right? You can make strange sounds on synthesizers, of course you can, but it's even cooler when you can do it on a real piano. It sounds, I mean, honestly, I don't think the recording does it justice. It sounds like a piano, but different, right? <clears throat> so we build crazy music instruments as well, but it takes a lot of know-how, a lot of technology, not just on the electronics, and computing side, but also on the musical side. We want to build things that people will actually use, not just things that make, you know, crazy sounds. By the way, uh, I forgot that this um, piano is actually featured um, <clears throat> on the soundtrack to the Disney movie Christopher Robin. The composer of that, uh, John Bryan, uh, for that soundtrack liked, it, liked the sound so much he wanted to use it in the movie. Um, <clears throat> we build apps for uh, institutions like the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, again, and probably a lot of you are from the Philly area. Maybe some of you have been to the orchestra. Um, <clears throat> we have a fantastic orchestra. It's one of the best in the world. Uh, we're also the first to have a system like this, which is an app that when you go to certain concerts, it actually follows along with the piece and tells you about the music as it's happening. The system's called Live Note. This was actually a Drexel senior design project that we did. Uh, we prototyped it for the orchestra and they loved it. And so we got some additional support to, to create the full system and deploy it. And now when the orchestra is actually, you know, performing in front of audiences, there are eight to 10 concert series per year that are live note enabled, right? And it's the only orchestra in the United States to have a system like this. Uh, but again, a lot of tech went into this, a lot of music now, musical knowledge had to go into this, right? It's not that you're just throwing up slides like PowerPoint, right? They have to be meaningful. They have to be um, unobtrusive, right? The last thing you want to do is bother your neighbors in the audience or in, in the concert hall. Um, so it gives you a lot of um, customization, right? You can set the, the brightness of your screen very low. Uh, it uses very subtle colors. But again, we worked with the content, uh, the education office of the orchestra to actually produce the content uh, that people see so they can follow along. Um, you know, how does this affect electrical engineering student, electrical and computer engineering students? Well, these were students in my lab, mostly, who uh, some of them hadn't been to the orchestra before. So I made them go. Uh, that's the kind of professor I am. And afterwards, they were like, yeah, that was nice. You know, that was 90 minutes, nice sounds, but uh, I didn't get it, right? Because if you don't have that musical background or that training, you don't know how a symphony, you know, is structured. That it's you know so many movements, and that every movement has a main theme and a secondary theme, and then a development section in the middle and a recapitulation. Right? If you don't know that, you get lost super super easy. So we wrote this app and the system so that uh, to help guide people through that. So if it's your first time at the symphony, or even not your first time, but you're not familiar with the piece, it helps give you guideposts along the way. Um, let's see, I have a question in here. Yeah, we did build the piano. I mean, we built all the, I mean, we didn't build the piano itself. That's from a local piano company, Cunningham Piano, but we built all the electronics that go on top of that, that make it the magnetic resonator piano. Yeah. Uh, we've done projects with uh, the opera. This was actually, we built uh, self-playing musical instruments that go on the stage of this piece, which is called Sophia's Forest. So this is, uh, they're self-playing, well, mostly percussion instruments. So that bike wheel that you see in the background that actually spins by itself and makes sort of really creepy sounds. Uh, and then there are a bunch of stacks of wine glasses. This is actually an instrument called glass harmonica. Ben Franklin invented it. Uh, but this is a robotic self-playing glass harmonica. So these, these, in, these uh, instruments become not just part of the sound of the piece, they actually become part of the staging part of the set. So fortunately, I don't have a video for this. Uh, I mean, I, I do, but I, I'm not gonna show it to you because of time and also because I'm not really allowed to because it's an opera performance. Um, I'll skip to this, which is uh, a much more recent piece. Um, 
this is called Drumhenge. And I'll just play the video so that you can learn a little bit about what Drumhenge is. Watch the full video on drumhenge.com. I'm sharing all the links to the videos there. Hopefully, I mean, tell me if the audio video quality is really, really bad, um, but I am sharing the link, the links, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the chat as well. So you can see the YouTube videos and, and whatnot. Yeah, so that was a really, really cool piece, uh, cool project we did with an artist in residence, Peter English. We actually had a competitive process to pick to people had to apply, um, musicians and artists, and they, they uh, applied for our program. And then we worked with Peter for over a year because a lot of times, here's something we discovered, that when you build some really cool technology, uh, and you know, some of us are artists, I'm a musician, a lot of my students are musicians as well, uh, but you can't think of everything, right? You don't think of everything ahead of time and you build something, hey, this is, we think this is really cool. And then you give it to a musician or an artist afterwards and they say, yeah, that's really cool. But did you think of this, right? And we're like, no, we didn't or we forgot or we just, we didn't, we didn't consider that, right? So, uh, you know, you may have heard this term co-design, right? It's, it's kind of a, whatever, it's a buzzword, but it, there's some truth in it, which is that, you know, you wanna bring people in at the early stages at, the, develop, at the, the conception stage of things. So working with an artist and putting engineers together and saying, hey, what are cool things that we can do? Well, you know, we wanna do something cool with drums. Um, you know, we, we didn't know what we were gonna build at the beginning of this process, right? But giving people with some technical knowledge and creative space to come up with something cool. We had a lot of experience with electromagnets, of course, because of the magnetic <clears throat> resonator piano. But um, we wanted to also do something that was percussive, like drums. And so now you can get the, the best of both worlds. And there's a ton of electronics that go into this. Each drum is its own computer. It's got a microcontroller. It's got multiple microcontrollers in it, actually. There's a bunch of power electronics to power the uh, electromagnets that need to be very, very precisely controlled. Or else, uh, you know, A, they won't do what you want them to do. Or B, they, will, they have a tendency to overheat and blow up. So you want to avoid that. Um, so you have to do a lot of power management. They're all Wi-Fi connected as well. So there's a bunch of networking that has to happen as well. So you, know, you need to know a lot about how to put all this together and to make it work right. Um, we have done some work with drones. Uh, this was a terrifying project. This project took years off of my life, but I'll show you the highlight video. <laughs> So yeah, those are drones. And if you've ever been near a drone, you don't ever want to be that close to that drone, right? Uh, it's terrifying. To be like within two feet of a drone uh, is a really, really scary experience. So these dancers are my heroes. I mean, they were fearless throughout this. 
So we did this piece with a dance company based in New York called Parsons Dance. And um, it was for six dancers. Uh, and then the initial version was with two drones. We premiered that in Philadelphia in 2016. Uh, nine performances, no crashes, no injuries. So I was very, very pleased with that. Even though we had plenty of crashes in rehearsal, no crashes, no injuries in performance. It is, um, it is uh, yeah, it's terrifying. So um, I'll show you the prototyping phase, which we never actually got to show anyone. I'll tell you why in a second. Let's see. This thing doesn't want to play. All right. You know what? I'm just going to save that for later here. I'll, I'll put the link to the video over here. This is with dancers and six drones. This is actually at Drexel. This is in the Basson Research Center. We have, um, you know, a big lab there that we turned into a drone lab. Uh, it is crazy and it is terrifying. But the reason we didn't get to actually perform it, we we're going to do this in New York. And uh, what you need to very, very precisely control these drones is you need, they're, they're automated. If you, if, you, if you try to remote control multiple drones in one space, you are almost guaranteed to crash, right? You just can't do it. Like human pilots are not good enough, right? Uh, and it's hard to see and whatnot. So th they have to be computer controlled. So we had to build basically an indoor air traffic control system for drones, which is really hard. Um, but the way you do that is you use a system called motion capture you put infrared lights and cameras all around uh, the stage so that you can spot the drones and you can see where they are at any moment, right? <clears throat> so the problem when we got to New York and tried to install that motion capture system was that um, the theater was close enough, we think, to a subway tunnel and the vibrations from the subway would cause vibrations in, uh, in the lights. And so our motion capture cameras kept swaying like this. And if they're moving, you don't have a good fix on your drones or anything for that matter. So we ultimately had to cancel that. It was very, very sad, but um, uh, I linked the rehearsal video. You can take a look at that if you wanna see some more terrifying stuff with drones. Okay, how do I get to the next slide? Okay. Why is that not? Okay, now I'm back here. Hold on, let me just move to the next slide and uh, I'll show you one more. <clears throat> one more cool piece of technology that we've made. Okay, sorry. Are the drones able to communicate with each other? Not really, they communicate basically with a server, right? Um, they communicate with a server and uh, the server is the traffic controller that's trying to keep everything together. Um, just sometimes our things make it into commercial project products. Right. And so I'll show you this. This is touch keys. It transforms your keyboard into an expressive multi-touch control surface. Sensors on the keys measure where you place your fingers, giving you unprecedented control over your playing. But it's still a keyboard, so it's already familiar. The touch keys are touch sensors that attach to your keyboard. With touch keys, you can use finger motion to control any aspect of the sound. Here, let's see, I'm gonna to try to talk over the video. Yeah, yeah, so let's see, somebody mentioned the Seaboard. It's actually, um, we built this before the Seaboard and instruments. My, my former student uh, actually consulted on the Seaboard. So we've had a hand in that as well. Um, let's see, do these projects work only with for electrical engineering majors? Uh, no, sometimes we bring in teams uh, with other groups, computer engineers, uh, mechanical engineers as well. Yes, uh, the, this is, so we built this, you know, in, in our lab, you know, basically the idea of putting a touch sensor, a touch uh, touchpad on each key, right? Uh, we originally did this for the, the piano I showed you before, but it turned out not to work so well for that, but it works great with synthesizers. So there's lots of cool things you can do. I'll, I'll let you watch the whole video. 
Um, let's see, what a question about the drones, which was, was the infrared light attached to the camera or installed inside of it? So it's, it's a single unit, actually. It's a motion capture system. They, they, it's, a, it's a pretty small. The cameras are about this big, but then there's a ring of infrared lights around it really powerful infrared lights. Um, they throw about, you know, maybe like 30 feet or so. So you need, still need a lot of them to cover a stage. Yeah. Yep. Uh, do you have to press a specific part of the key to get the right starting pitch? Um, no. I, I mean, well, you, it depends how you map it, honestly. I mean, you can basically say, hey, start from wherever I am and then go up or down, or you could try to map it uh, in absolute position as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so everything that I do in my lab uh, is around this framework we call STEAM. So not just STEM, right? Not just, not, I mean, STEM is great. I'm a STEM educator myself. I love STEM, right? But there's more to it, right? The, the, the story around STEM was always that, you know, STEM leads to all this great technological innovation. And to some extent, that's true. But it misses, um, it misses a key component, I think. And that's having some kind of creative, artistic design process around that. So when I say STEAM, for me, it's not just that, hey, electrical engineering students go take an arts class or art students go take a math class, right? Yeah, sure, you should, and I hope you do. But no, it's that we can do cooler things when we integrate across the disciplines, when we try to make robot music videos, when we have dance performances with drones, when we have, you know, incorporate cool new music technologies into keyboards that are then used by, you know, Grammy award winning artists, right? That to me is what STEAM is about. It's not just separate disciplines. It's about integrating things because we can do more together. Right. So we take that down to all sorts of levels as well. We have, I mean, again, this summer we couldn't do it because of the pandemic, but for the past several summers, we've run a middle school camp for West Philly kids uh, called Young Dragons, which is all six weeks of all STEAM, uh, all brand new STEAM programs. And this was started by Malcolm Jenkins who until recently was the starting all pro safety of the Philadelphia Eagles. But because of contract issues, uh, he's now back with the New Orleans Saints. And that's very sad for me because Malcolm's a great guy, but he helped us start this program. His foundation helped us start this program, which does continue and hopefully will continue in future summers as well. And so that's a great way for, um, you know, engineering students, uh, education students, art students to get involved at, with community efforts at Drexel and right in, right in West Philadelphia. For a long time, uh, for more than uh, uh, 13 years now, well, it would have been 14 years this past summer, but again, because of the pandemic, we've run a high school camp called Summer Music Technology. Um, and uh, that's a one week camp. We, we call it like School of Rock meets Robot Camp because everybody builds cool things like robots and, and controllers and instruments, and then we use them in musical performances at the end of the week. Uh, occasionally, I have alums of the SMT program show up in classes as electrical engineering, electrical and computer engineering majors. If you happen to be an alum of SMT, give me a shout out either in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, uh, let's see, oh, then this, sorry, this is just to prove that we've done it for 13 years. And you can see I get, um, for a while I was getting fatter and fatter in every picture. All right, so we've done that for many, many years. 2019 was our last instance because we couldn't do it this past year. Okay. So what's the point? The bigger point of it, and, how, and, and of course, what does this have to do with electrical and computer engineering? Um, if you look at the history, whether it's music, I mean, obviously I've shown a lot of musical devices here, musical entertainment devices, um, but really, I mean, the same thing applies to, uh, to video, to movies and motion pictures, to uh, you know, all sorts of different media as well, that the history of technology and entertainment are completely intertwined, right? That I believe that it's a, a, what we call a virtuous circle, right? that great art inspires great technology and great technology inspires great art. So, um, you know, I have, I, I can go into much more depth to this. I don't really have time, but uh, you know, the people who invented these technologies, technologies, Edison with the phonograph, right? Or people who um, made pioneering efforts in recording practices like the Beatles, right? Uh, and, and other great producers of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond, right? push those technologies to the limit to then inspire great art, 
And then again, that, that, that inspires future generations of technologists as well. So I can draw a direct line from the advance of each of these technologies to the, um, not just the devices, but the, you know, the forms of entertainment and media that, we, that, that define our lives today, right? In fact, it's not just that. I mean, uh, let's see, I don't know if I have this on the next slide or now not, but you know, I would argue the reason the smartphone exists, and I'm sure you all have a smartphone, and of course it's you know, the centerpiece of, of most things we do in our lives these days. The reason the smartphone exists was because of the MP3 player, right? It was because of the iPod, essentially. The reason the iPod exists was because of CDs and computers. And the reason, you know, those exist were because of music, right? So the advances in music technology, whether it's different formats, whether it's different, uh, I mean, encoding schemes like MP3, uh, there's a great story and there's a great electrical engineering story around MP3 uh, that I'll tell you another time. Um, but, you know, it's developed by engineers and it's, it's amazing and changed the world. Uh, but that, Without that, you don't get things like the iPod, you don't get the iPhone, you don't get modern smartphones, you don't get all the technologies that we have um, today that are uh, you know, really redefining how we do things. So what can you do as an electrical and computer engineer um, <clears throat> in this field, in this area? I've been very lucky. I've had some amazing students who worked in my lab and going on to do amazing things. So, uh, you know, uh, going to work for Netflix or Pandora or Spotify or doing startups. The last one, Secret Core Laboratories, that's a startup trying to use AI and music understanding to do better music recommendations. Um, you know, all these folks were Drexel engineers. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them were under started as undergraduates, some of them started as graduate students, but they're all Drexel engineers who are making a tremendous impact in the you know in the music industry and in the the, the entertainment industry as well um <clears throat> last year for the class i had eric schmidt come back and talk about his work he was actually previously at pandora and then moved to netflix so he was one of our presenters last year um i don't know that he's going to be on the schedule for this year but we'll have other amazing uh presenters on lots of different fun topics throughout the throughout the term if you want to know more about this kind of stuff, uh, I have a blog and a newsletter called Creating at a Distance. Uh, this is not a requirement at all. I'm not making you sign up for it, but if you find this stuff interesting, if you like creative and expressive technologies, whether that's you know music entertainment or robotics or whatever, uh, I, I blog about this stuff every week, or almost every week. Uh, it's at creating-at-a-distance.com right there. Um, actually, let me put that in the link so you can get there. And the, it's sorry in the chat, so you can get there super easy, All right? So you can go there, see my previous newsletters, and you can sign up. Um, <clears throat> I've given a couple of TED talks. Um, the most recent one was for TEDx Drexel U. Uh, that this was last spring, uh, right at the start of the pandemic. So I did this talk as a video talk that I produced entirely, you know, at home by myself, uh, but trying to use as much technology as possible. So if you want to hear me talk for like 10, 15 minutes about this, you know, uh, about uh, creative technologies during the pandemic, uh, you can find that online as well. Here's the link, I'm putting the link for the chat in the chat for that. Okay. Or you can just go to the TED site and search for my name and it comes up. Okay, first extra credit opportunity of the year, right? Um, so you're all here for today's class. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have an event next week, next Tuesday at four o'clock. Uh, we have a series of talks called Creative Conversations for a Changing World. I'm going to be moderating a discussion with a couple of composers and uh, the founder of an amazing singing group called Votus 8. Votus 8, if you just go to YouTube and put in Votus 8, you will, and if you like singing at all, or acapella singing in particular, you will be amazed. Um, they're based in London uh, and they've been doing some amazing stuff during the pandemic. So, uh, and then the others, Ellen Fishman Johnson, or sorry, Ellen Fishman is um, Director of Arts and New Media at SCH Academy, a local school. She's also a composer. Uh, she has started a project during the pandemic uh, called Choir Forward. 
since we can't actually sing in choirs during the pandemic, right? That's one of the most dangerous things you can do. Um, you can, uh, you know, what we're doing is creating these large scale virtual collaborations. And she started one between multiple schools and a professional choir. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if you're unable to edit the, the spreadsheet. I thought that would be a cool thing. Um, but apparently we are, we have pushed Google to the limits. So I'm sorry about that. If you're still in there and if you can just close out, maybe that'll open enough, enough slots so people can, um, can put it there. Uh, yeah, refresh the page if, it's, if, 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 if you're having trouble, just keep refreshing the page. Um, and then Jay, Jay Fluellen is another amazing local teacher and composer. So we're gonna be talking about all sorts of virtual, virtual uh, music and art collaborations during the pandemic. Uh, something I've been focusing a lot on in my blog and my newsletter. So here's the deal. This is your extra credit opportunity. If you attend the talk, which is about an hour, um, a little more than an hour, next Tuesday, you get credit for one class. So if you need to miss a class in the future or just don't even know and just want to bank that credit, you get credit for that. So you do need to show up. You need, you need to register for the, for the talk. So the registration link you can see there, or I will put it in... So extra credit, <clears throat> you can, uh, it didn't give you an automatic link. So let me bit.ly slash creative conf two. There it is. You can click on that, you can register. And if you show up and stay for the session, you will, um, <clears throat> you'll get one class of extra credit for, for this class. So you can bank that. And if you have to miss a class later on the term, uh, Okay, so let's see. I'm almost out of time here. So, all right. So the last thing for today, uh, the survey is open now. You can have the, you can get the link uh, off of Blackboard, or I'll just put it right here. This week, the survey is just a test. All right, it's just, it's just for practice. But I do suggest you do it. So the survey, uh, it's really short. You should take a look. You do have to log in using your Drexel ID, right? That's your XYZ123 at drexel.edu, whatever your, your login is. So that's why this week's a test. If you have trouble getting in, you know, let us know, let me know, and you know, we'll try to get uh, figure that. But you do have to have a, a legitimate Drexel ID to fill out the survey, right? The survey is just basically your reflections on today's uh, lecture, on, on the lecture you just saw. You give, it, uh, give us a rating, you give us, uh, and you have to have a short response, like one to two sentences about what you found most interesting about the lecture, right? Should take you like two minutes, right? Max, maybe three minutes, max, right? Here's the catch, survey closes at 3 p.m., right? So you only have a short window of time to do it, right? So the point is that you should be at the lecture, take it in and give us some quick feedback at the end, okay? If it didn't ask you to sign in, okay, I, maybe it doesn't ask you to sign in. It's supposed to. It's supposed to restrict it to Drexel IDs, but maybe you already signed in. It thinks you already signed in in another way, all right? Um, okay, so I'm not, all right. If you're having trouble accessing it, you can try to give me some feedback in the messages here, but if not, or send me an email. Send me an email if you're having trouble accessing it. Again, this week doesn't count. This is just practice. But starting next week, it does count. It does count. So you want to figure it out this week so that you don't get screwed next week. Okay. I will stay online. Class is done. So if you need to go somewhere else, that's fine. I will stay on for a few minutes to chat. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for being here. Oh, gosh. Next week. I got to tease next week. Next week, we have an amazing speaker. She's a PhD student at Drexel, but she's also an engineer at Merck. She is working on a COVID vaccine. So her talk is about how you engineer vaccines at pandemic speed, right? She's our speaker for next week. It's gonna be awesome. So if you needed any more incentive to be there other than a great, uh, it's a great topic. Okay, so I will see you next week. Keep chatting if you have issues with the, with the uh, survey um, but, uh, or email me. And otherwise I look forward to seeing you for a great presentation next week. Thank you.